Hello and welcome. It's Brett Clicko with Spider Fit Kids. I'm here today with my brother, Dr. Bart Clicka. Now, one of the reasons that uh, I, and I'll talk more about the doctor in a bit. He has his PhD, but uh, Bart and I talk um, about this stuff a lot. And his, as you'll learn more today, his field is in child wellness, essentially child safety. And, and I'm going to, that's going to, we're going to sort of unravel what his involvement is at multiple levels in the country. But I, I thought he'd be valuable because uh, I know it's, it's, it's valuable insight for me, but I thought it'd be valuable insight for everyone here. I, we, have, we have PE teachers, we have uh, classroom teachers, we have sport coaches, we have personal trainers, we have parents. And one thing that I know through Spider Fit with our initiatives to create a future of happy, healthy, active kids, uh, one of the, the things that I've realized, the, the deeper you go, is that we tend to be myopic as these sort of fitness professionals, uh, particularly in the fitness world. When we're looking at the health of kids, we get into this idea of we can just get them to exercise more. We can solve all the problems. If I can just have more exercise, uh, things like that. And, and while that is our, that's really our wheelhouse, and, and many of us have, have made great strides in our community with that, but I, I wanted Bart today to come share uh, really a bigger picture of, of child wellness. I mean, what does it really mean? What situations are these kids coming from? What homes and communities are kids coming from where their health is so dramatically impaired? I think with that understanding, uh, for those of us who work in the sports field or, or maybe it's the fitness field or whatever it is, we can develop a much larger view of the issue at hand. And so our interventions, you know, where opportunities to get involved in our communities uh, could grow. So thank you, Bart, for, for taking the time today. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, the only person I'm going to have call me doctor is you. And I'll just point out, you just called me Bart. So I'll just make sure that you call me Dr. Clicka for the length of this interview. So to, um, uh, as I remind uh, my brother many times, uh, if anyone here on the call actually has a medical emergency, <laughs> he is not that type of doctor, just so we're clear. But uh, enough, so it, just the bio, I mean, honestly, the reason you'll see as to why I, I value his opinion and, and wanted him here today, but uh, Dr. J. Bart Click is the chief research officer with the National Organization Prevent Child Abuse America and a research faculty at Florida State University College of Social Work. Prior to joining PCAA, Dr. Clicka was an assistant professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Montana. His research examines the causes and consequences associated with child abuse and neglect in an effort to prevent its occurrences. Dr. Clicka is on the National Board of Directors for American Professional Society of the Abuse of Children and is the chair of the Maltre oh wait, well, chair of the ASPAC Prevention and Publications Committee. He's the senior editor for the ASP our APSAC Handbook on Child Maltreatment, and an Associate Editor for the Journal of Interpersonal Violence. Dr. Click is currently the co-principal investigator of a CDC-funded grant looking at the effects of paid family leave and child care support in the prevention of multiple forms of violence. And with, with a resume like that, I'm still faster and better looking. I think it's, it's important to, to note. Uh, no, but you can see this is this is his work, and and as I want to preface today's conversation too, uh, as we get into discussion of of, of policy, as we get in discussion uh, with maybe interventions that he's seen through research and some of the the things that he's going to talk about, understand that the the point of this is not political. The point of this is not to uh, say, well, one political policy or one political pet uh, uh, sort of dogma is is the way to go. It's just results. It's just what he's seen in the research. So please separate. I know that uh, if something that, that comes it comes across as, well, that's not my political belief or whatever it is, this, the, the intention is not to step on those toes. The intention is to share data so that we can take that and decide, okay, well, what's the direction? Within our communities, what are some directions that we can go in order to help kids? Because that's truly what we all want. So, Bart, why don't you take a minute and just tell us a little bit about the organization Prevent Child Abuse America, maybe what you do with it and, and more about how the organization helps kids. You bet. So at Prevent Child Abuse America, we're headquartered here in the Chicago land area. We've been around since about 1972, and our work is really focused on what we talk about as the primary prevention of child abuse and neglect. So not waiting until costly child welfare intervention is necessary but really getting ahead of the curve to ensure that child abuse and neglect never occur 
in the first place. And we do our work in a number of different ways. So first of all, we have a network of state chapters across the U.S. So we have chapters of our organization uh, in nearly all 50 states. And really, it's our state chapters who are doing that state-level work, coordinating a prevention plan, working on state-level policies, working to coordinate the various services that exist in communities across the U.S. We also operate the Evidence-Based Home Visiting Program, Healthy Families America. This is a program that works with new and expecting parents really to identify what are the family's needs and how do we help families connect with their new child. From a child abuse prevention standpoint, if we can get families' needs met and allow them to be able to connect with their children, we believe that that really prevents child abuse and neglect. We have nearly 600 Healthy Families America sites across the country. We serve about 70,000 families per year with our Healthy Families America program. We also do a fair amount of work in the areas of uh, communication and just raising public awareness about the issue of, of child abuse and neglect. You can't see here, or maybe you can see it on my shirt. We've got the pinwheel for prevention. April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. Uh, if you're around town, you might notice that there's some pinwheel gardens planted around courthouses, around different organizations. That really is our national symbol of child abuse prevention. It reminds us of great childhoods. It reminds us that we need to invest in early childhood. Uh, and then finally, we do a lot of work at the policy level. And I say both policy at the federal level to ensure that we have policies in place that support that real community-based prevention uh, work that many of our state chapters do, but also in making sure that we have funding uh, to be able to implement proven strategies like home visiting uh, at a state level. And we also provide some technical assistance to our state chapters who are, are really the ones who are on the ground meeting with their state legislators, uh, ensuring that we have the correct and science-backed policy array uh, that we know prevents child abuse and neglect. So that's a little bit about our organization where I spend my time in the organization is on research and evaluation. That's both thinking internally as an organization, how do we study the work that we're doing and make sure that we <clears throat> are making tweaks as necessary to improve it, but also um, on actually conducting research. And so I've got my own program of research up and running at the organization where I actually, right now, I'm evaluating a couple of uh, different policies. One of them is paid family leave that's being implemented across 10 states uh, in the U.S., as well as looking at child care subsidies. We know that those early years, uh, especially around the birth of a child, are so critical for developing long-term attachments between parents and their children. And so making sure that we have policies in place that reduce stress for parents so they can really concentrate on, on their children's development during those critical periods. So that's a little bit about the organization, a little bit about what I do with the organization. So with the, so you, you talk about, uh, obviously you have access to data. You, you've seen a lot of data. The big question within in our, in my world, and we talk about this in the, the health, physical health world, uh, is the, the ramifications of the pandemic. Kids are at home, uh, parents are losing jobs, that mental health is such a struggle. In terms of data, because I know from the fitness side of things, it's the data is starting to come in. It takes a long time to get good, reliable data. We have access to some questionnaires and some early. So what have you seen when it comes to just general overall well-being of children in the home? Have you seen any data emerge from uh, the pandemic? There's a lot of data out there. And some of it's um, things that we've actually done. Some of it's been uh, stuff that I've, I've read from other entities. So very early on in the pandemic, and I'm talking about within weeks of official uh, shelter at home orders, uh, a colleague of mine, Dr. Shauna Lee at the University of Michigan, uh, had the foresight to say, look, we're shutting down schools. Kids are going to be at home. We know things like social isolation are risk factors for things like child abuse and neglect. And so did this survey at the end, I believe it was at the end of March 2020. So we were a couple weeks into this pandemic. And what she found was even very early on, two weeks into it, you saw parents starting to talk about, hey, I'm, I'm starting to get worried about how I'm going to make ends meet. Um, I'm starting to experience troubles, a, a lot more conflict at home. I'm, I'm yelling at my kids more. 
I'm finding that I'm more irritable. I'm experiencing symptoms that would mirror anxiety or depression. All of these things together, even at the very early stages of the pandemic, we're starting to raise some red flags of, for those of us who, who work in this field. And over time, there were more series of, of surveys that came out. We worked closely with the American Academy of Pediatrics and Tufts Medical Center. We conducted three separate surveys during the COVID-19 pandemic to understand something about caregiving and how our families doing. And really some of the highlights that I would pull out was, you know, we asked people about their financial circumstances. About 40% of folks said, hey, this has negatively impacted our family. About half of the respondents. Now, now keep in mind, we did three separate surveys. Each survey was of 3,000 adults. So we're talking of a sample of 9,000 adults across this country. 50% of those individuals had reported needing to use some type of, of governmental resource during the pandemic, which just, that highlights to us the amount of need that families were experiencing. And then when we saw things asking questions about employment loss, high levels of people having to leave the labor force and many times, you know, disproportionately affecting women who were, you know, leaving the labor force oftentimes to, to care for children. And then we, we get the obvious question all the time. What was happening for kids during the pandemic? Was abuse going up? Was abuse going down? And I, I, I typically respond like this. When we look at the ER data that's coming out, so the CDC put out a a study that they had done looking at ER utilization across the country. Pretty good, solid data. They have reporting from around 70% of ERs across the country. And what they saw is emergency department visits as a result of child physical abuse actually went down uh, during the early stages of the pandemic. But the proportion of those visits requiring hospitalization actually increased. And so, you know, that raises some questions for us. What's going on? Is it that there's more serious cases of physical abuse coming on? Maybe the quantity's down, but the seriousness might be the same or even increased. And then there's other studies that have come out. There was one that came out last week looking specifically at the state of Connecticut. But they look not only at ER data, but also the, their, their child welfare data. So when kids are reporting, to child welfare for abuse and neglect, states keep track of this. And when they keep track of it, they report it to the federal government. And that gives us our national estimates of, of child abuse and neglect. But in the state of Connecticut, what they found was looking across their ER and child welfare data, child physical abuse went down, child sexual abuse went down, but child neglect actually went up. And so what this is raising in terms of questions for us is, okay, maybe physical abuse was going down by these data, but why is neglect going up? And when you think about what is neglect, neglect is failure to be able to provide for your child. It makes sense, right? Families are struggling as a context of the pandemic. Maybe they, don't, they lost their job. Maybe they lost their house. Food insecurity was a big thing during the pandemic. And so we're trying to make sense of all this data uh, when we look at our official child welfare data, so like I said, all the states report in their data uh, about child welfare traffic, those, those children that come into child welfare, the kids that get investigated for child abuse and neglect. And when you look at fiscal year 2019 to fiscal year 2020, you actually see decreases. And so some people kind of, they, they say, well, look, child abuse is going down from 2019 to 2020. And I think we have to be critical consumers of the data that we're looking at. And we always have to be asking, what could be causing these decreases aside from just flat out that child abuse is going down? And, and there's work coming out to say, look, child welfare practice changed during the pandemic. They weren't able to investigate cases in the same way. There were child welfare agencies that had difficulty because they didn't have enough PPE for their child welfare investigators. And so we have to keep in mind as we're seeing these different reports come out about child abuse during the pandemic, that we need to understand why we might be seeing the trends that we are. And the final bit of data um, that, that we've been looking at is actually a study that was released, I think just uh, a couple of weeks ago from, from the CDC. And this was a nationally representative survey of adolescents. Um, during COVID-19. 
And I think most striking from these data are that a little over a third of the adolescents who responded to this um, said that they were struggling with mental health during the pandemic. And we've heard that across news outlets, we've seen it across social media, this, this mental health crisis that's going on. Um, about 40%, a little over 40% said that they had actually experienced symptoms of depression uh, during the pandemic. Those are incredibly high numbers. And so we know mental health of adolescents is huge. But for some of the work that I do, the other things that were pulled out is high percentage, we're talking over 50%, we're reporting experiencing emotional abuse uh, in the house, as well as high rates of, of physical abuse. And so to me, these are the various data points that we're using uh, to really try to understand how are kids and families doing as a result of the pandemic and many of the safety precautions that were put into place, like things like shelter in place. Yeah. Well, and I think what's important again is, is as we hear that as educators and as coaches, as we hear those numbers, a couple of things that are important. I think the school teachers that are, are listening to this, I think school teachers have access to varying socioeconomic situations, and they've probably seen this at a, at a much uh, more highlighted level, this, these disparages that happen. I think often in the fitness field, uh, working through a gym, or if someone's working in a community, they may not, depending on the community that you're in, you may not see this. I know where, where I'm at, we don't necessarily see uh, some of these, the, these sort of secondary ramifications so of the, of the pandemic. So it's just important, again, to just take this into consideration, those kids that are coming to you, and, and really mental health, it seems across the board. I mean, I've, I've written, I just written, I wrote something a couple months back for a or publications regarding exercise and mental health and the numbers, like you said, you know, 40% and some of these studies coming out, it's like higher than that. Co college students, 70% had had a depressive episode in the last six months. I mean, it, so again, mental health is at the center. So as we're formulating our plan, you know, to create that future of happy, healthy, active kids through our work in sports or fitness, it's important to remember that these other aspects are key and, and whether or not we have the skill set to, to manage those, and we're going to talk about that in a bit. You know, what resources do we have that we can steer kids towards that, that might be at risk? But so, Bart, with the pandemic, obviously, you know, you talked about the data. It's, it's, it raised more questions. You know, you're looking at that. Well, we're seeing this, but why are we seeing that? And, and I think that and, and even in the, the world of fitness, it's, it's this tangled web right now. They're trying to figure out, you know, what's one thing that leads to the next and, and all that. But if you were to, you know, now we know that, that pandemics happen in modern society. You know, despite our technology, despite our advancements in medicine and all that, we can, a pandemic can come through. So if we were to be more proactive, particularly with the goal of preserving the health of children and the safety of children, what could we do now knowing that this is something that can happen? How could we, uh, week one, you know, something comes through, what things could happen that would actually decrease the negative blow to mental, physical, emotional health? So, so one of the ways that we talk about our work is we talk about levels of prevention. So I'll give you a, I want to give you a quick analogy to, to really set up my answer. So imagine that we have a beautiful cliff at the edge of our community and everybody loves to come to the edge of this cliff to look out and watch the sunset. Well, as luck has it, you know, it's a cliff. And as people are watching the beautiful sunset, some people get too close to the cliff and they actually fall off. And so as a community, we could come together and say, let's develop different strategies or solutions to this problem. The first one, we could say, well, we could just put ambulances at the bottom of the cliff. And when people fall off and get hurt, we patch them up and we get them on their way. That's what we think about as tertiary prevention. It's kind of after problems occur, we need to have something in place to patch people up and get them on their way. Somebody else could raise their hand and say, well, it's not so much falling off the cliff that hurts people, it's smacking into the ground that hurts them. So what if we put safety nets part way up the cliff? And so we could catch people um, who potentially fall off the cliff and catch them early so they don't smack into the ground. That's what we think about as secondary prevention. And then we could say, well, if we didn't want people to fall off the cliff in the first place, why don't we just put safety nets at the top of the cliff? Now, the reason I give that analogy is to say there is no one single solution or strategy that is the answer to a complex problem like this. We know that using my analogy that we need primary, secondary, and tertiary strategies. 
even if we have the best cliff at, or excuse me, the best fence at the top of the cliff, some people are going to fall off. We need those early detection systems to be able to catch people before they smack into the ground. And we know with our best plans of trying to catch people before they hit the ground, we need to have those ambulances at the bottom of the cliff. So what are some of the lessons learned that we have from the pandemic is we need strategies. We need to make sure that we have those systems in place for those families that are struggling. We need to invest in those services, treatment services. You know, we're talking a lot about mental health. We need evidence-based treatments for kids, for youth, for adults who are experiencing mental health. We need substance use treatment uh, for those who are experiencing substance use disorders. At the same time, we need to build an infrastructure within uh, our society that allows us to be able to identify and provide supports for families. So what, what do I mean by supports? I had mentioned earlier, we operate a home visiting program that works with new and expecting families. It's these types of services that allow us to connect with families early. They might be experiencing some type of challenge in their life, but if we are able to get to families early, help them navigate some of the complexities, some of the challenges they're experiencing, we believe that we can ultimately prevent things like child abuse and neglect. And so then what are those fences? Those things, those fences, those things that are at the top of the cliff, really we've talked about, we're letting the data drive our decisions around things like policy. There's many, many policies out there right now that the scientific literature is pointing to have an effect on reducing child abuse and neglect, paid family leave, ensuring that people have paid time off to be able to care for a newborn child. And when that time runs out, ensuring that they have the ability to access and pay for high quality childcare for their children so they can return to work and know that their children are receiving high quality care. We've also think, seen things like Medicaid expansion, minimum wage. And like you said at the beginning, this is allowing the data to tell us um, what are the proven strategies for the prevention of child abuse and neglect. We saw you know, the implementation of the child tax credit. When you look at data pre and post implementation of the child tax credit, you saw nearly 3 million children uh, re lifted out of poverty when you look at the monthly poverty rate. And so these are the types of things that we're paying attention to. And I think building those into an, a policy infrastructure that allow us to have that, that sort of safety net for families who might be experiencing temporary challenges are going to go a long way to facilitating the health of children and families. So just being ready and just understanding which policies and just having those ready to go and probably pulling the trigger sooner when we see this coming so we don't dig ourselves a deeper hole. And on the health side, the physical health side, that's something that we talk about a lot too. But to, to go, I, I know that you sent me a presentation you had recently done and, and you talked about, because here you're talking about these programs and these programs, but there's costs obviously associated with those. But you were talking about how adverse childhood events, it's, it was, the figure is almost a million dollars a child. It, it costs. In costs right now, if those fences aren't there, if we don't have a system, an effective system, it ends up costing us about a million dollars. And I don't know what all goes into that. I'm assuming probably some sort of health care. And because then, and, and I'll give you a chance to sort of respond to that in a second, but, they, but then I saw in the same thing data about you know, obesity. We would pull if, if you could help regulate some child decreased childhood, early childhood uh, bad events, you would. Uh, was it like two and a half million um, fewer kids suffering from obesity, two million uh, fewer cases of heart disease? I mean, these are things that we're crossing the bridge now. We're looking, okay, let's look at the whole environment, the community, the home, and that's impacting individually how much is heart disease costing us? How much is obesity costing us? And those are some of the things that I think are part of the conversation and and it's it's worthy of both side, mental and physical health in working together. So I don't know if you have anything to say about where those numbers came from or what, you know. You, you bet. I've got a lot to, you, you planted a lot of Skittles along that trail. Um, or maybe for this, I should say, you planted a lot of protein shakes along, yeah. uh, along that workout yeah. bench. Um, so the first one is you talk about the lifetime economic burden associated with child abuse and neglect. And so you know, the figure that you're referencing there comes from folks at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. 
they tried to estimate what is the lifetime economic burden associated with child abuse and neglect. So what that means is really across some somebody's life, how much would the consequences of abuse and neglect cost? And they factored into that, you know, things like child welfare, juvenile justice, special education, like you said, healthcare costs, um, productivity losses in later life. And they estimate that it's in the ballpark of 800,000 and some change per child victim across their life. So these aren't, it's not costing a million dollars a year. And obviously these are estimates. So if we want to poke holes in it, we can poke holes in it. But it gives us a defensible sense for how much does a case of child abuse and neglect cost over someone's lifetime? And those aren't individual costs. So it's not like a somebody who experiences child abuse is going to have to write a check for that. Many of those are costs that get passed along to taxpayers, mm -hmm. right? Because we're paying for programs, we're paying for child welfare. And so it makes a strong case for needing to prevent many of these things from occurring in the first place. The second little uh, trail that you had provided me in, in that was, I think, reference to one of the biggest studies that has really shifted and shaped the way that we think about early adversity and trauma. And that's the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. This was conducted back in the late, uh, in the late 1990s. And it was actually a, a physician who started in an obesity clinic. And he was noticing that many of his patients were coming in and, and talking about all of these challenges uh, from early childhood. And, and, and over the years, he was trying to understand why some people did really well in treatment, and others didn't. And he really had this hypothesis that I really think that there's something to do with experiences of trauma and adversity early in people's lives and how they function in adulthood. So they did this in collaboration with Kaiser Permanente and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in California, did a large scale retrospective study. So they took adults who were part of the Kaiser system and said, hey, how many of these things happened to you before the age of 18? And so they asked about things like child abuse and neglect, domestic violence, divorce, you know, having a parent who was struggling with substance abuse, mental health, um, having a parent that was maybe incarcerated. And so then what they did is they said, okay, for each one of these individuals, we can calculate what's called your ACE score, Adverse Childhood Experiences Score. And it's anywhere from zero, meaning I had none of these things before 18, or, hey, I had all 10 of these things uh, before the age of 18. And they also asked those adults about their current health functioning. So how are you doing in adulthood? And in essence, what they found, and this has been replicated uh, in many studies across the country, is that they found that for those who experience four or more ACEs, okay, compared to those who experience none, those who had experienced four or more were at increased likelihood for many of the leading causes of death in this country. And we're talking about things like heart disease. We're talking about things like obesity. But also we're talking about many of the problems that we're, we're talking about today substance use. We're talking about economic challenges that people experience later on in life. And so it's really been this study that has helped the field be able to say, look, this is why we need to care about what happens in the lives of kids, because it has long-term implications for how they're doing later on in life. And so the final piece that you referenced was an actual study that was done by our president and CEO who oversaw all the work for the CDC on adverse childhood experiences before she took over as the CEO of our organization. And she said, look, for years we have the data, we know that these early adversities lead to, to poor outcomes. But what if we were to prevent these from occurring? How much of these downstream problems could we actually prevent? So they did a study and found that if we were to prevent adverse childhood experiences from occurring, we could prevent upwards of 44% of cases of depression. That's nearly 21 million cases of depression. We could prevent things like COPD, drinking, smoking, obesity, and many of the other leading causes of death. So it's these types of studies that really help us understand the link between experiences that happen in childhood and how adults are doing, or 
talking about some of the things they might be struggling with later on in life, including health problems. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and it's in, and again, we, a lot of us see that on the, the physical side and in the, in the health world, we see this, we see the outcome. We don't see what created that. We see an outcome. I think the complexity of working with adults too, you know, a lot, a lot of people are working with adults and, and in different, whether it's a community program, whether it's a one-on-one thing through a gym, whether it's an initiative through a hospital where you have access to more of the community. So again, the importance of that is just for, for those of us who work with kids, understanding there's more to it. Now to, to bridge, because as I'm seeing, and I hope everyone else sees here, the, the quote solution, which I think that's a bold word, you know, the, the, the term solution, but I think more to use your metaphor, you know, I think that we're, I don't know if we're good, but it seems like we invest in the ambulances at the bottom of the cliff. And that's what they do in health too. It's like, okay, well, once everyone's screwed, here's a pill or, you know, here's incarceration or here's whatever I think. And, and we're looking in the health world to, okay, let's get back to that fence. Let's, let's catch more people before it's problematic. That's why we're so passionate, you know, through spider fit about working with kids because we, and, and so it, it looks like if, if there's some way to bridge that early on um, in, in getting these, these, you know, working on the, the childhood experience and, and having these positive outlets, whether they be sports or just positive outcomes with, when it comes to that, what dynamics within the family, um, have you seen, and you've mentioned it, uh, you just mentioned a little bit, but within the family, what dynamics have you found are the most important when it comes to, um, either, uh, making, um, sort of facilitating health or what things actually, you know, decrease the likelihood of a healthy outcome? Well, I would even expand beyond family and say connection. And, you know, for, for the audience that is here, I think you can't downplay the effect that you can have in someone's life. The most consistent thing that we find across, I mean, across research from my personal experience of, of working in the field is Kid, when kids have a safe, stable, nurturing person in their life, that helps facilitate well-being, even in the context of significant adversity. So I had talked about that adverse childhood experiences study, and there's work out there actually looking at the number of positive childhood experiences that you have and ACEs in your life. And they find that even if you have a high level of ACEs in your life, a a lot of adversity going on in your life, if you simultaneously also have those positive experiences in your life, those positive experiences buffer some of that that negative stuff. And so we know that connection with people, that can be a family member, that can mean an extended family member, it can be a teacher, it can be a coach, sometimes it can just be a neighbor. And we're not talking about you don't need to be a therapist in order to be able to connect with a kid. Learning a kid's name, being able to say hi to a kid, those are things that make kids understand that somebody is thinking about them, someone cares about them. The importance, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a coach uh, for, for many of my daughter's teams, and I get so nervous to go out and, and coach because of a lot of what I know. I put a lot of pressure on myself as a coach because I understand I don't know what's going on for this kid uh, when they when they leave practice, when when they go home. But I understand that something I do, something I say can have a real lasting impact uh, for a child. And so as much as I'm out there trying to, you know, you know, teach soccer or right now try to uh, figure out how to coach softball, I'm realizing that it's not always about. It's not always about the sport that I don't understand what's going on in these kids' life. Can I provide them with a positive experience that in 10 years, they would come back and say, hey, I remember that coach. I kept screwing up, but you know what? You always had a smile on your face and you always told me, hey, it was awesome because I was, I was giving it a really hard try, even though I wasn't the star player. And it's those types of things that I think that we can do. I think one of the messages that I would say is that The things that you can do are not necessarily always gigantic. It's not always giving a million dollars. It's not always donating 20 hours a week of your time. Sometimes it's the really little things. Mm -hmm. Having access to kids, having access to families, realizing that, you know, it's the small things that can really add up and create that 
positive experience for a kid or for a family. I think the straw, and it's such a great point. And I hope everyone here really takes that to heart. And because we talk about it all the time, I talk about it, I know all of you talk about it. But as a teacher, a coach, uh, anyone who has an interaction with a child, honestly, you could be their light. You can be their lighthouse. And here's where it gets, it's more challenging and difficult. And, I, and Bart, you know, I think you might, but sometimes it's that kid who's not the kid who shows up early and is the easiest kid to get along with and stands in line perfectly. Uh, they might not be the one having the adverse life outside. It's that kid who you can tell is struggling. And, obvi- and all too often, I think, at least in the context of where I've worked in sports and all, that kid's like, all right, everybody get on the line. we got to run because, you know, little Tommy won't be quiet. And, oh, well, Tommy, you go sit out because you're not. And it doesn't mean that we can't have disciplinary measures. can't mean we can't mm-hmm. keep order. But I think that's our challenge as mm-hmm. coaches to understand these things are happening, understand to be a lighthouse for those kids is something that, that we can really challenge ourselves to do. So in this process, Bart, you know, we have these, this opportunity to be mentors. In that relationship, what resources do we have when we do uh, find that you know, we, have some, we suspect that, that something's you know, wrong? Or I know through you know, teachers and um, through coaches, I know through coaching, uh, it's, it's a minimal training, but you know, if you're going to coach for an organization, you essentially sign off on a paper. They say, hey, yeah, you know, contact these people if you see something, but there's not much training. What, if, we, if we suspect adverse um, events going on in their life, what resources do we have? What's our first step? You know, I, I'm always a big advocate on, you know, when, when you think about being a coach, when you think about being a, a teacher, really trying to obviously get to know your kids, but get to know their families and, and being a resource of being able to go up to a, a, a parent and say, Hey, so glad you're out here. What have you found? I, Hey, this is where I'm really struggling out there. Have you found anything that's, that's been really helpful in working with Timmy or, you know, something like that, because we've been in situations where, you know, it's oftentimes the child that uh, isn't paying attention is running off when we're, we're trying to do something that poses a challenge. I would also say though, sometimes it's the opposite, right? It's, it's the kid that's really struggling, but comes and is doing everything perfectly. That is overly self-critical of themselves. They're not acting out. Uh, if anything, they're really trying to please. So uh, the other message I would say, it's not always just the child that's acting out. Other times we can see things manifest in over-perfection or, or things like that. So I say, you know, get to know families, talk to them. As it, you know, as I'm talking as a coach right now, get to know the families, call them by name, call the kids by name. That sounds like such a minor thing, but when you connect to a parent by calling them by name, um, they're more willing to engage. If you get them engaged, it's going to be more of a partnership. I would say, you know, we, we, whether it's coaching, whether it's school, we hear a lot about mandatory reporting and what our legal duty is to report uh, concerns and, and suspected concerns. And that's something that we definitely want to take seriously. If you have a concern about a, uh, a child, you're concerned that they're being abused at home, you can make an official report. Uh, you can call 1-800-4-A-CHILD. You can call your local child welfare agency uh, to place a report for serious concerns about child abuse and neglect. But I would say that even, you know, oftentimes I will leave a situation and I'll have that pit, that feeling in the pit of my stomach where I'm like, I, I'm not worried that it's child abuse, but you know there might be something going on. And and if you're like me, you might not know all the resources in your community. You'd say, "Oh, I don't even know where to start with this." Um, and so, you know, we have found there's a, a, a great resource called FindHelp.org, uh, where if you go onto their website, you type in your zip code, it pops out a list of different resources in the community, and that can be resources for housing transportation, for behavioral health services, like counseling. And so I say, you know, that's another resource at your disposal when you're, you kind of have that pit of the stomach feeling of, you know, this isn't a reportable thing, but, you know, I'm kind of concerned. Maybe I could educate myself about what our community has. Call an organization and say, what do I do if I have a concern about a family like this? Or even, you know, at times providing a resource sheet um, to a family, or if you're involved, for example, in a sporting context, uh, being able to say, hey, on our, our, on our uh, webpage for our, our baseball league, 
could we put a list of these resources uh, for families there? So they're not having to come and say, hey, can you give me a referral to counseling? But it, it provides another easy way that families can be able to access uh, supports and services. So just a few things that, that I think of when I think about how it is that we make sure that we're being a support, but also uh, knowing what our responsibility and duty is to report if we have serious concerns. So in, in our role, what, what I'm hearing from today is in our role as coaches and teachers and, and, and even trainers and involved in sort of the world that I come from, looks like we can be that guiding light. We can be that lighthouse and to just work on ourselves. I mean, if there's a skill that we can develop coaches and teachers, it's that, that skill of listening. We talk about that a lot, but can we listen? Can we truly hear and see and, and, and actually absorb you know, the, the, these, these kids' energy, get to actually know them and their families. And, and, and instead of coming from a, almost a judgmental, which I, you know, you got that kid in the team that won't pay attention. You got that kid that's running around, they kind of, you know, quote, brat, and then you just, oh, you're driving me nuts. But we have that opportunity. And it sounds like in getting to know the families becomes important uh, and just creating that positive environment because the positive environment that we create very well could be uh, what gives some of these kids a lifeline. And so, and then, you know, third, it just sounds like the, the broader we can keep instead of just getting myopic about, okay, exercise, 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 which many of us default to in looking at the broader piece and seeing where could we create some synergy between the health world, the physical and the mental health world early on in the process. And I, and, and even from this conversation, it has me thinking of what are some things I could do with spider fit um, you know, earlier on. So with that, I know that we got a bunch of just people fired up here because the spider fit community is, is, is here to serve and here to help. How can we get involved with our community? And like you said, you know, many of us, we're not going to have 20 hours a week type of thing, but what are maybe some, some organizations or what are ways that we could get more involved uh, with just child welfare across the lifespan? Well, I, it's such a great question and there's no one right way to get involved. I, I say, obviously, you know, connect with one of our chapters uh, in your state. Say, look, I don't have a lot of time. I want to do something. How can you get me patched in? That's definitely one way, but we are not the only organization or entity. So to do that real quick on that, you said connect with one of our chapters. They would just go to preventchildabuseamerica.com? Just preventchildabuse.org. Okay, I'll, I'll have the link and everything, and, and but uh, preventchildabuse.org, and then they could maybe look for, is there a chapter in their area? So that's one opportunity. Right, there's one opportunity. I would say, you know, we're, we're always putting out information for folks on social media, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, that type of thing to get information coming out. But I would say, you know, no one organization or entity is going to be able to take on health and wellness by themselves. And so there's a lot of different organizations. Get to know your, your local community. Um, and I would say, you know, and I said it before, it's oftentimes the little things that, that can be helpful. And I would venture to say that you all are likely already doing something in your life that is contributing to the health and well-being of kids and probably just don't necessarily put that stamp on it. We had done a survey a number of years back asking people about their involvement in child abuse prevention. And it was a big national survey. About a quarter of people said that they're involved in child abuse prevention. But then when we asked people, do you donate to a child and family serving organization? About 80% of people did. When we said, do you mentor or provide some type of support in your community? Do you provide child care? Do you mentor? Do you do all these other things? High percentage of people were doing that. And my point is that you are likely already doing stuff. You can support organizations financially. You can donate your time thinking about great organizations out there like Big Brothers, Big Sisters that provide opportunities for kids uh, to have some mentorship through faith organizations. There's a lot of ways that you can get involved in the lives of kids and families through sporting contexts to be able to be a coach. Oftentimes, we don't think about those as child abuse prevention strategies, but those are the things that we're talking about. And I would say, even starting small, if right now you're saying, I spend zero hours a week doing anything in any of these realms that you just said, commit to an hour, commit to an hour in the next year, that is a step forward. Mm -hmm. Using social media to be able to share articles, to raise awareness 
uh, about this type of information, that is a way that you can help build awareness so we can ultimately create the conditions uh, for great childhoods. Well, and, and you hear it one hour, folks. So if you took put that in the context of here, the Spider Fit tribe, we, we have about 10,000 people right now uh, through our newsletter list and things. So one hour with 10,000 people at 10,000 hours uh, given towards the cause of creating a future of happy, healthy, active kids. And, and so that's the opportunity we have, folks. And, and Bart, I just want to thank you. Uh, thanks for, for sharing and, and taking the time, because like I said, we have these conversations and, and I always... Uh, find it interesting to just see, okay, what, well, what, what has worked? You know, what is the data? So we can argue about our, you know, quote beliefs and this and poly yada, yada, but at the end of the day, brass tacks, what have you seen uh, at that? And, and honestly, and as you can tell from his resume, there's probably very few people that have, um, are, have seen more or know more on that. So thank you so much, Bart. Thank you everybody else for coming today. Bart, any final, um, how can they find more? I know you shared the website. Let's do it again. How can they find out more about uh, your organization and, and what you do and, and maybe get involved? I would say go to preventchildabuse.org. Follow us on socials. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we're putting out information all the time. Uh, sign up for our e-newsletter. You'll stay in kind of in the know about what's going on, uh, participating in things. We have a digital advocacy day coming up at the end of the month. You can find more information on our website about how you can actually get involved in some of the policy related work uh, that we're talking about doing because we need everybody having a loud voice talking to their policymakers at a federal level at a state level at a local level ensuring that we're prioritizing the needs of kids and families early and then the final thing that i would say i mean thanks for having me here but just was curious how many miles you rode this weekend uh, mr brett Klicka. I, uh, I have a car, so I don't have to ride as many miles on a bike as, as you do. But uh, yeah. it is, as you can see, the brotherly love is always there. And uh, thank you, everyone, for, for coming by. Please follow up. I'll be giving you a link with questions. Please follow up with any questions or anything that, that you, any questions you may have, or if you just want to know how to get more involved, or if, if there's any other information, uh, please respond. Let me know, and, and I'll engage Bart again. So, again, thanks a lot. Thank you.